go for it. <laughs> Yay. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. I have ZZ here with me today. We're going to talk about multifamily. I am Rendemic and I am in the beginning stages of multifamily. So I'm having so much fun making connections with people in multifamily investing and just picking their brain, asking questions. And so I asked ZZ to join me. We had a really great conversation um, a few, maybe a couple months ago. And I'm like, I really need to stay in touch with her. So I wanted you to jump on, share a little bit about maybe start with your background and then how you got into like wanting to even do multifamily investing. Yeah, well, I just want to say, first of all, Rinda, thank you so much for having me. It's definitely nerve wracking to do a podcast. I mean, I don't really know if my insight is something that people even want to like hear, but here I am. It's great. If it inspires someone at the end of the day, that's all that matters, you know, um, for me in terms of, you know, single family versus multifamily, um, when I first got into like real estate, like knowing that I want to get into real estate, it was like, early last year. And I was like, Hey, you know, everyone I think comes in like trying to get into single family because it's the easiest to break through, right? Like single family, you can easily do just kind of by yourself. Like you can find a, like just a property that's listed, right? Get an agent, purchase it with your own money, like do renovations. If you are even able, like if you're good at that, get it ready and just rent it out. Whereas multifamily is a completely different world. And for me, I was like, okay, single families where I'll start, but like ultimately multifamily is what excites me the most. And I was like, but multifamily is where the big dogs play. Like who am I as one person to come in who's so new to like get in there and be like, hey guys, I'm here. I want to play with you kind of a situation, you know? So it's definitely a lot of I mean, I'm still struggling with it now, like imposter syndrome, like, you know, feeling like I'm not good enough. But I also at the same time, I feel like that's also a very limited mindset as well. Right. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with, too, especially just in general, not even in the real estate world, trying to figure out like where you belong, where your mindset is, what your goals are and where you ultimately want to be. For sure. Last year, I had a ton of like unclarity is that a word I don't know is that a word like not being clear in terms of, not being clear in terms of like what it is that I truly want because I was like let me do single family even though my heart is not in it but like it's easier for me to do it and I'll do it and I feel like once I have enough experience then I, I'll feel like I can be good enough to do multifamily with like you know the cool people of the world and I don't think that's necessarily true honestly I feel like it kind of almost holds you back in a way because I feel like if I had yeah. truly just jumped into multifamily from the beginning, I would be further than where I am today, right? Um, however, I am grateful for my journey here because I think not knowing exactly, I think the journey also is also finding out where it is that you actually want to be so that when you do find out what your goals are, like where you want to be in this real estate world or just life in general, like you're, sh you're sure you're certain like, yes, I'm excited. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. Let's get into it kind of a situation. Yeah. I love that. And so your background is not in real estate. Not at all. So I'm a nurse. I used to be <laughs> actually it's so funny. Okay. Here's the thing. When I did for my undergrad, I used to be, I did accounting and marketing for my undergrad. I worked accounting for a couple years as at like a private and uh, private company. I hated it. I was like, I'm not the type of person to sit in an office and look at a spreadsheet for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for the rest of my life. Like that is just oh not me. I just, I hated the cubicle life. And I was like, went at the time, um, went through a little quarter life crisis, which is totally a thing, by the way, because a lot of people <laughs> go through it. But my quarter life crisis, I moved to New York for the summer and I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Like, what do I want to do? You know? And then ultimately, I decided I wanted to do nursing, actually. So I went to nursing school over on the East Coast for a little bit and then came back home to Seattle, which is like where, you know, all my family and my friends are. And then I did um, cardiothoracic ICU nursing for a little bit. It was quite intense, um, very stressed for sure. Um, and then I had a baby and I was like, this ICU life is not for me. I want to be home more often with my kid. You know, I want to 
have a less stressful job. And so that's when I transitioned over to PACU, which is pre and post anesthesia services. So it's mostly like surgeries um, where I help patients get ready for surgery. And then I also recover them after surgery, after they've had anesthesia, making sure that their pain is well controlled, their breathing is okay, they're awake enough, everything else is okay for them to either go home or get transferred to admit it elsewhere in the hospital. So that is my background. Yeah. And so then what took you, so then where did that transition come in from like, okay, now I'm nurse in the nursing industry. And then what makes you want to get into real estate investing? Yeah, I think uh, it's so funny. I think part of it is like, you know, honestly, I just think it's just knowing what other people are doing outside, um, just in general in life. You know, I was like, I was at a point where I was really happy with my life. I was like, I have at this time, I was like, I have two kids now. My work-life balance is great. I'm just really happy. Like, let me think about what else can I do as my next chapter in my life to elevate my life a little bit more. And people always talk about um, real estate as a great way to kind of bring yourself to that next level. And you don't necessarily, it's not one of those things where you have to go to like law school or med school to be Mm -hmm. able to do, you know, it's something that if you read a few books or if you like know what general idea of what to do, it's one of those things where you just do it and then you get experience and then you just get better. And it's kind of like nursing or any job that you have too, right? It's like you gain the education. That's just the tip of the iceberg, right? The real experience is you actually doing these things and learning experience and knowing how to deal with these situations that come up that really takes you to the next level. And so for me, I was like, I'm sure everyone else, nursing doesn't pay that great. Seattle pays well, but the cost of living in Seattle is also very high too. And so I was like, what are the things that we can do to create passive income where I have a busy personal life where I don't have to do that much and still be able to spend, you know, get that income come in and still be able to spend time with my family or trying to figure out how we can lower our taxes, those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. So I really started looking into real estate, read a ton of real estate books. Like I read the, um, cause I live in Seattle. I'm not going to invest in Seattle. Seattle's insanely expensive. (laughs) It's also super land or super tenant friendly. So it's not really great if you're a landlord. So one of the first books I read was like David Green's, I think investing out of investing in real estate out of state or something like that. And so that was really good. And it was eye opening. And then it just progressively started like getting more into the knowledge, the education, more into the community of real estate, connecting with other people is like, I was like, wow, this is a whole new world. I never even thought of, you know, people, I like when people always ask you like, oh, what are your like goals for the, like for the next year or the five years? And I'm like, I hate those questions because if you had told me five years ago that I would be sitting here with you on a podcast <laughs> talking about real estate, I would be like, you are insane. Get out of town. That's not true. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just kind of love, I just love how life works out like this. Oh, that's so great. I love yeah. it. So how did you get down the path of like creative finance then? Yeah. <laughs> So funny. Literally, I think the algorithm got to me, the Instagram <laughs> algorithm. I kid you not. <laughs> kid you not. I think I was just looking. I joined like bigger pockets because uh-huh. when you first get into real estate, like you're like, I don't know what to do. And yeah. so at the time, I was like, oh, bigger pockets is like the kind of community to go to, right? For a kind of any kind of real estate thing. And I think after that, my phone was like, oh, this girl's interested into real estate. Let me send her all these random, like real, no, seriously on the, on the Instagram, I would just be scrolling and then it would be like random, like uh, real estate investor, real estate investor, real estate investor. And then I was like, what is happening? And at this time, like when I was first getting started, I was like, okay, I know if I get into real estate, I want to create an LLC, right? I want to create an LLC to figure out like to set up my company properly. So I don't have to deal with the headaches afterwards. And I was having a really hard time finding a lawyer who could do that for me. Like mm-hmm. I called around in my local area all a lot 
And they're like, oh, we don't set up companies in Wyoming. Or like I tried to reach out to this other lawyer who's supposedly like good at real estate stuff. And she just wasn't really teaching a whole lot until I saw one of Pace Morby's YouTube video. And his he was just giving it out for free. It was the exact information I was looking for on how to set up a like a LLC properly. And I was like, are you kidding me? Who is this guy that's just willing to give out this information for free? And then I went into like, I went down a deep rabbit hole, just like <laughs> stalking his or his YouTube channel, like, like kind of so many videos. Kind of like, yes. Like, yeah. No, a hundred percent. I was like, because before this, like, I reached out to several like popular or famous um, real estate investor on Instagram, and I would be like, hey, you know, I'm just getting started out. I would love to connect with you, like, learn just like you know what I can offer you, how I can help you, etc. And mo like a lot of them would just around be like, hey, great. Thanks for reaching out. Here's my um, my course that you can join. Mm -hmm. And then that would be the end of it, right? And so then when I watch, when I took, went to that rabbit hole down on Pace's YouTube, I DM'd him and I was like, hey, just wanted to let you know, thank you so much for putting this information out there. Like I'm just in awe of what you do, et cetera. And he actually responded. And Lovely. I was like, oh, like what you actually responded, like you're actually genuine and, and you yeah. want to have a conversation and you weren't like immediately like, Hey, join my, my course kind of a situation. Like, what is this? Like, I'm not used to this, you know? And so I think that really took me back and I was really surprised. And I know like people who are in the creative finance or in sub two, like, they're like, Oh, I've been following pace for months now. And then finally I decided to pull a plug. Like I joined the, his community and whatnot. For me, I was like, I watched a ton of his YouTube videos that he put out that were so helpful in terms of even if you're not in creative finance, I think it was just really helpful to know just real estate knowledge and education in general. Right. And so I watched a ton of that and I was just like, I think I only like learned about him for him two weeks before I was like, okay, I'm locked in on this guy. <laughs> like I was really hesitant to join any kind of mentorship because everyone's like, oh, you think like, thirty, forty thousand dollars into a yeah. mentorship, they're all scams and you don't get anything. But I was like, well, if this guy's willing to put this kind of content out for free, like what is what else is he gonna give me if I actually mm -hmm. join him in his adventures together, you know? I and it's honestly, it. yeah, it's honestly been life changing. I mean, that's how we met, right? And so yeah. I've met so many of my real estate friends through that. And it's just it's been phenomenal, honestly. Yeah, it's really, it's really such a great community. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like there's nothing like it being like in the traditional real estate space. I'm like, there is nothing like this in real estate, like mm -hmm. as helpful as people are. Um, and you've got like, you know, light years ahead of experience. And then you've got people that are like one step ahead of you. And then you have people that are behind you, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, everybody's willing to help. And I, I truly do love that. Um so you went down the path and you, you kind of figured out you wanted to head into multifamily. Um, and then obviously what I'm finding, because I'm very new to multifamily, is there are just so many different avenues, right? There's so many different things you can do. So what did you start to feel like was like your niche that you were going to kind of go like all in on? Like what did you what do you love like doing most within the multifamily space? Yeah, I mean, like you said, once you decide on multifamily, there's still a lot of things you need to figure out, like figure out what kind of like commercial or multifamily you want to do. Do you want to do mobile homes? Do you want to do RV parks? Do you want to do apartment buildings? Like, or even within apartment buildings, do you want to go high up and do like 100, 200, 300? Or do you want to do like mom and pops where they're like 12 units, 20 units, 30 units, you know? Um, so I think for that, like once you figure out in your multifamily space, like, what you want to do. And um, when I mentioned earlier, when you first get into real estate, single family is very easy to do on your own. Multifamily is a completely different beast. It's basically like an elephant where you need partners to come in together and tackle it as a team together. For like smaller units that are like, you know, 10 units, 20 units, you can do it by yourself. But if you're going, if you're trying to scale up, trying to go to like 100 units, 20, 200 units, you need someone to come in who can do what they're good at and you can do what you're good at and tackle it together. So for you, like for someone coming into multifamily, you kind of have to figure out what are you good at? Do you want to talk to brokers 
or do you want to, you know, commercial brokers? Do you want to talk to uh, like direct to seller? Do you want to do capital raising specifically? Or do you want to do asset management or underwriting? Like you have to figure out what it is, which one of these elements excite you the most and what where your strengths lie, right? Um, I joined like Vina's community and one of her things she really um, talks about is the Clifton Strengths test assessment. I don't know if you've ever taken it. Mm-hmm. I'm very like I'm very wary about like any kind of online personality test because the results I always take it with a grain of salt, and they're like mm, most of the time not that good, yeah, right? Like, what day is it? it? Depends on yeah. the day, right? Yeah, like it depends on your mood. What how strongly yeah, the month is it? <laughs> how strongly do you agree with the statement? Yeah. However, when I took the Clifton Strength test, it was um very interesting because the format is very different. I remember specifically one of the questions they asked me was um like because it's on di- two um two questions that I ask you, and it asks which one do you agree with more? One of them was like, I like relaxing and going on vacations. And the other one's something ridiculous. Like I like cleaning. And I was like, well, I know which one I'm going to (laughs) choose. And so I thought that was really interesting, but the results came out and it was surprisingly pretty accurate for what it is. And I, I even showed it to my husband who was like, in his office and I could ask him as he was reading the report, I could hear him laughing because I <laughs> knew that he was like agreeing with what, what the report says. However, for me, it said that I lead best with influency. That's my main theme. Like there's like strategic thinking or like yeah. relationship building. And then there's like executor or something like that, I think. And so for me with my, um, my influencing, I have to think about, do I want to do capital raising or I could also do, um, uh, like direct to seller or like um, direct to broker, right? Like broker outreach kind of a situation. And for me, like, I just like talking. I don't really want to be on the phone calling like smaller mom and pop like owners being like, hey, do you want to sell to me? I like more in person, like, you know, interactions or just mm-hmm. building relationships more. So I focus more on the capital raising. And I like going back to what I said earlier in terms of accounting, I don't like sitting at the desk. Yeah. Looking at spreadsheets. So I know underwriting is not going to be for me. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Could I do it? Yeah. Like I could probably get really good at it and I'm great with numbers. Like, but do I want to do it all day long? Definitely not. And that's not where I'm going to thrive. Right. Yeah. So you really have to figure out where your strengths are and then figure out where in the multifamily you fit in the multifamily space you fit. And then from there, figure out like, okay, these are the things I do want to do. These are the things I don't want to do that kind of helps you gain more clarity, right? And even for me, after I've decided, okay, like I should use my strengths to raise capital, you still have to figure out like different things too. Like you still need to gain clarity in terms of like, you know, who do you want to raise capital from? Like figure out your investor avatar, figure out like how you want to raise capital, like, and just like figuring out your branding and all of that gets into get, you can get really deep into it. So yeah. it's not like once you figure it out, it's like super easy. It's like, you know, you, there are still things you need to figure out. And so that's also part of the journey on trying to figure out who it is that you want to be and where it is that you really fit in into the real estate space. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you 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 have now ventured down the path of capital raising. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. So how, how is that feeling so far for you? That feels like a pretty good fit. I think so. It feels like a pretty good fit. I'm signed up to go to some uh, medical conferences this year. Um, because if you do want to raise capital, by the way, do not ever raise capital at a real estate meetup because everyone (laughs) else is going to be there to try to raise capital as well (laughs) for their fix and flips or whatnot, you know? So you need to go to where the money is go to tech conferences, go to engineer conferences, go to medical conferences, go to all these different conferences That's really good that tip. like, yeah, that where like people have the money, but they don't know what they could do with their money. So for me, like my investor avatar is healthcare people, right? Because yeah. I work in healthcare. Yeah. You need to find people that you can relate to, find that common thread that you have, that you can like discuss with them, bond through and then you're able to develop that re- like initial relationship, get them like interested in what you're doing. Like you, you can tell right away if someone's more interested in real estate or if they're not. And then, then like, you know, from there you can have a more genuine conversation. And so then um, 
with that, you just have to figure out where you fit in as well. And then just go from there. And, and also like, so and capital raising can like take you so down so many ventures too. So mm-hmm. you, um, is your plan to like, are you working with a specific team and you guys are raising capital for that? Like one property, or are you going to end up doing like a fund of funds? Like what's your strategy in capital raising? Yeah. I mean, there's, like you said, there are two, there are several different ways you can do it. The fund to fund is the easiest way where let's say I have a group of investors, let's just say five for now that can bring each bring in like a hundred thousand dollars. Then I already have $500,000 that we're able to bring in and I can, let's say, bring it into Paces fund, into the sub two fund, right? I could do that. Leverage Paces experience, leverage his team's experience, his team's um, capabilities, like their skills, like they're good. They already know how to manage an asset. They know how to operate an asset. So I can utilize all of that and leverage all of that. So I know my investors will be taken care of. That's like, they always say when you start capital raising, that's like one of the f- easiest way, right? Another way is you could, some people like to do like, as they call it, a capital allocator. So what that is, is people who like, you know, you find people who how already have who have already operated basically they have the operator experience they have people who source the deal find the deals for them and then what you do is you come in you bring the, your investors you bring the capital in and you say here's the money that you need take care of my investors and then I'm moving on to the next piece so that's what the allocation comes from right another part is for me I'm more interested in being a co GP like a general mm-hmm. partner aspect of it so I like for me. I want to make sure my investors are taken care of. And another way you could do that is also leverage someone with experience, like someone who's got great operator experience. They know what to do. They've been in the experience. So you're not utilizing someone else who doesn't know what they're doing to manage the asset. And that's kind of more risky for your investors too. Like if I'm bringing my investors money in that they've worked so hard for, I'm going to make sure that they taken care of and I'm going to make sure it's with someone who's really good and who's not just in it for the money. Yeah. Because recently I've, I have um, I met someone, all right, one of my friends at a meetup that I hosted in um, our local area. She was saying that, you know, a few years ago, the rates were so low. So everyone was buying, right? Because the loans were, the, the payments were so low and it made a lot of sense number wise, underwriting wise that like, oh, we can make a ton of money from it. And but now, and like, it's been like three to five years, all those loans are kind of starting to mature, etc. And those people who raised a ton of capital a few years ago, um, they they were making so much money that they were like, okay, I'm going to leave my W2. I don't need to work anymore because I made a ton of money. But the past couple, like in the past year or so, it's the market has been slow. It's been really hard for people to purchase multifamily because the sellers want a higher price, but the rates are also high. And so the buyers can't buy because they're like, we're not going to make any money from it. Mm-hmm. We're going to lose money and our investors are not going to make any money from it. So what I'd have heard is that some people are actually, they don't care if it's a good deal or a bad deal or a good deal or a bad deal. They're just raising money to put into like a any kind of deal so they can make fun money from it, from it because they don't have any sources of income. And I'm like, that's terrible. That's not what I, I don't want to be. Like, that's the exact opposite of what I want to be. You know, like when someone trusts you with the money that they've earned so hard to get, that's a huge responsibility. You shouldn't be taking it lightly like that. Just because they trust you and they have your relationship, that doesn't mean you can get greedy and just burn yourself like that, you know? Yeah, for sure. There's with capital raising, because I'm very, um, I kind of scored similar, like on the the Clifton strengths with like influencing and stuff. And I I'm not surprised people. at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love people. I love like just building relationships. Like you know that is just definitely my thing. I I do love outreach a ton. Like I really like getting on phones with brokers and sellers. But um, oh, do you? Yeah, I love elderly people. Like I yeah, <laughs> I love it. Like give me an eighty year old, and I'm like let's talk for two hours. Like all the things, tell me all the life, give me a marriage tip. Like, um, Oh, I love that. That's how you, but that's how you, you do it. You, you have to build a relationship. Yeah, it's more it. nurturing a relationship than like just trying to convince them to sell to you. That's yeah. what it is at the end of the day, you know? And I love that for you. 
<laughs> it really is. But, and I see that, like, I see the future of like where I'm at right now, because I'm doing a lot mm-hmm. of outreach to try to find what, you know, what I'm personally looking to buy. But I see the the, the next steps of that easing into capital raising. I feel mm-hmm. like that's going to be like a good, you know, next step for me. Um, and super intrigued by funds of funds. I think that that would be something I'd be interested in down the line too. With more experience, of course, I, I want I want to have like some proven concept, right? I want to make sure I can go to people and say, hey, this this is what I've done. This is what I'm invested in. And and I know that we've got the right people to take care of you. Just yeah. to what you were just saying. But um, and so, yeah, so I I feel like that's a next step. But I also still have like this bit of mindset and I work a ton on mindset, but I still have when I hear capital raising, I'm like, how do I go ask people for money? Like, it's still like that, like sense of like, okay. Like, how do you ask people for money? Yeah. You have to like break past this like crazy mindset of, because if you weren't, if you didn't grow up with money, if you were taught to save, 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 Mm -hmm. it can be really challenging to, to get out there and actually say, I mean, even running a nonprofit to ask people for donations is really tough. And that's like 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, you know, and you're like, Hey, you got a hundred grand, you know? <laughs> so it's like, so what did you struggle with that at all when you were like, Oh, oh. okay. Yes. A hundred percent. So here's the thing. When I first saw, I was like, Oh, do I like, do I want to do that capital raising? I feel like I'm just telling like, I'm like asking people for handouts when I do that. Yeah. And I kind of remind me, to, have you ever seen the movie bridesmaids? Oh, probably a long time ago. When, what's her name? Like <laughs> the short blonde hair with yeah. like her name is like Kristen something. And she sneaks into the like the like first class or something on the airplane. Oh, and yeah. she's like, she's like, help me, I'm poor. <laughs> and like that's what I think of when I was like, is this what I'm gonna be asking people for? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that's how I I feel that way. Like I feel nervous about it a little bit, you know. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah but I'm already battling that. Cause I'm like, this is where I'm going to go. And I know that. So how did you like, what? Yeah. I mean, it, it truly is a mindset thing. You honestly can't think of it like, Oh, how can I get this guy to give me their money? Ultimately? Yes. That's a goal. But like, it's more just like, how can I help them achieve financial freedom? How can I help them achieve so that they can make their work optional. Like they don't even have to retire. Like I hate the word retire because it's like some people just like to work too, you know? Like I want to get to a point like where my work is optional, where like I still love what I do. And so it's like, you know, I don't imagine a scenario right now (laughs) at least where I'm like, I'm just going to leave nursing altogether, you know? And so I think that's the hardest thing is just trying to figure out like, okay, now I want to do capital raising. How do I get people to give me money, but also feel good about it, right? Because you all sometimes people also associate it with like, like sleazy, like car sales people type of methods, which is totally not the same. And I've talked to people about this too. Like, how do you overcome that, right? Yeah. And they always say, although experienced people say, think of it as an opportunity for you to help them grow, for you to think about that. Then it's like you're presenting them with opportunity, not like hey, can you give me some money kind of a yeah, situation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not like, hey, can you give me some money? It's like yeah. I'm presenting an opportunity that can mm-hmm. help your money grow. And it right. is hard because like, you know, for and like my husband's family, they're like ranchers and, far- and farmers. And so it's, you know, like a very traditional mindset and it's fabulous, but it's like save, save or the, you know, a lot of times for me, like the 40 year you know, you work for 40 years, you're going to retire, you're going to just have whatever you have set aside. Mm -hmm. And there's real, like really no strategy for wealth. Yeah. Yeah. Building. Um, But it's what people don't know what they don't know. And so I feel like if you can switch that mindset into like, let's help people understand, like, this is how your money cannot sit in your IRA. Yes. You can sit in real estate and how it can, you know, double or triple what you can have it do over here. And so it is really fascinating to think about like even that education piece. And I think maybe an education piece is what can draw people into that for you, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. No, really. So here's some good tips for you. So the first, the first few conversations, it's never about like, you can get to that point, but it's always about relationship building. Going back to you talking to an 80 year old, mm-hmm. it's not 
convince them to sell to you right away. It's to establish that foundation in a relationship where you're like, okay, this person likes me. I like this person. Like also just finding a match, like making sure you're you're in synergy, right? Yeah. Sometimes you might just not be a, a good match for for each other as well. So you have to figure out like, you know, like, do we get along? Like, does this person like me? Is this person slowly to trust me? Mm-hmm. You know, you build that foundation relationship. And then you also start to build in like the educational aspect of it. So for me, I, my investor avatar is a healthcare professional, right? I want to build a community for my investors where they can share with each other their knowledge, their resources, the tools that they have to figure out like how they can grow their money outside of just traditional mutual funds or yeah. stock market or cryptocurrency <laughs> yeah. you know, or like 401ks. Like you can have people that come in and teach your investors these things. Like you can have, let's say, someone who who works directly with like infinite banking oh, to yeah. teach them how to do infinite banking, really teach cool. them how to do like self-directed IRAs, teach them like have a tax strategist come in and teach them like what tax strategies can they use to help like reduce their taxes? How will real estate help them um, reducing taxes? All of these things are education, right? And you always lead with value first. So if you have things that you can come in and teach them about these things, or they're like, oh, look, this person genuinely cares about like what I know and how I want to succeed. And I always say, like, I provide these tools for you. You don't have to invest with me if you don't want to, but I want you to have the knowledge that you need to, to make an informed decision. That's That's all I want. That's all I want at the end of the day. If you can make an informed decision, then I know even if let's say they invest with you or Pace, then like I know at least they know what to do and they're protecting themselves moving forward on how to decide whether or not this is a good thing to invest in. That's all I care about at the end, at the end of the day. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. The education piece is something that, I mean, yeah, it didn't even cross my mind like until this conversation. Yeah. That is super interesting to, to really start to help people like that. And it, it, sometimes, you know, when you grow up and you don't have a lot of money, it's hard to believe like, oh yeah, somebody has like hundred grand sitting in their bank account. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, actually <laughs> there are people there. And then you realize like the really like smart, wealthy people are like, yeah, I, I can have access to a million dollars cash mm-hmm. right now, but I have like 10 grand in my bank account. Cause I don't yeah. put put there. Like, no, has, you don't. It has to go out and, and make more money and do yeah. work and come back yeah. and bring more money. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Oh, this is how people do. <laughs> yeah. No, a hundred percent. Like even for us too, like we're like, you know, probably upper middle class for like the Seattle area. And so for us, like if you look at our bank accounts, we're dirt poor because all of our money is in our brokerage accounts. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> They're just sitting there accruing in other ways. Yeah, yeah I love it. I love it. <laughs> but it's, and it's so true. So it is super eye opening. Like I have not actually talked to many capital raisers. Like I don't, maybe they're just more, it's interesting. Maybe they're just out like trying to raise capital and like less quiet around <laughs> I don't know. Or like you said, maybe they don't try to like go to real estate inve- event or investor events because they're like, ah, there's already a bunch of people there. Um, but it is really fascinating to just hear that and, and talk to you about it. So I want to ask you to another, one more thing, um, on like your kind of journey so far and where you're at, how was it for you? Like, did you end up finding a team to work with or are you kind of working solo and just, you know, finding like, with your capital raising, are you finding that funds or um, funds or properties for people to put invest into, or are you actually like with a team? Yeah, there are two different ways you could do it. I know people who have done it where like they form teams, basically, like they found have found other people where someone's good at underwriting, someone's good at um, like asset management, someone's good at capital raising, another person's good at um, reaching out to like brokers and sellers, um, and then they form t- team together. Um, another way you could do it is, you know, capital raising is a full-time job. You have to be constantly trying to think about like the different ways you can capital raise or like where you, what your next steps are. So another thing thing is as long as you like have people who are willing to invest, you can find experienced operators, right? Find Mm -hmm. established relationships like real estate at the end of the day is honestly just a networking thing. Like find people who have the experience that know how to operate that you trust and just 
continuously like JB with them on a case by case basis, right? And so that's how another way you can also form a partnership basically or find your business partners. Um, like finding business partners are freaking hard. I meet with a ton of people on a daily basis. Yeah. It's it's honestly almost harder than dating. <laughs> like my yeah. husband and I have been together for 12 years now. It's great. But like finding someone that you like, finding yeah. someone that you trust, um, that like have the same work ethics and right. the same professional standards as you is really freaking hard. And yeah. I feel like people get weird with money, you know? Not to say it can't happen. I definitely think it happens. Like it's just for me, it's been hard for me to find like people that are like focused on these other aspects for me to be like, you know, I've met you a couple times. I think this could be a good like partnership going forward. So then I'm right now I'm just solely focused on building my investor base and figuring out like the education tools and resources that I can share with my investors to help them make an informed decision. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And it's so true because I feel like even so like, um, you know, when you start even dating those people and you start actually working together or yeah. like, you know, setting, t carving time out to actually work together, you know, and, um, and then finding deals and trying to, it's, it, it exposes things that you're like, could I really partner with you? Yeah. When we find, cause multi, I mean, it's a long game, right? Like mm -hmm. you're not, it's not like single family, you just find, you know, one every other day. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Very much a long game. And so, I mean, I've doing, been doing a ton of broker and seller outreach for months now. And Good for you. Under contract. But, you know, I feel like I'm getting close. But at the same time, it's just, it, it, it is like you start to work with people and you're like, who actually yeah. could we partner yeah. together for five years, seven years, 10 years? Like, more yeah. on this, you know, truly a business. Um, and do we mesh? well. And so you start to really realize those things. And then it's like, okay, I've invested time here. And then I realize this isn't the right space. And then I have investing time here. So it is, it is interesting. It's been an interesting journey on that side of things for sure. Yeah. I kind of thought it would be like, um, kind of single family teams, you know, like in sub two, there's a lot of single family teams and wholesale mm -hmm. teams. Yeah. You know, they got acquisition people and dispo people and, you know, lead man, like all the things. And and I kind of thought like I would find that in multifamily and it's like not true. <laughs> because, like, it's maybe. hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. And it's like I've met a few people where I'm like, oh, we really hit it off. This is great kind of a situation. And then you get to know them more and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I definitely do not yeah. want to get into business with you. <laughs> <laughs> like friends, yes, I will be your friend all day long, but business, yeah. no, like I can't do that to it, my investors, you know? It, it becomes a lot more real. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it does, it definitely is taking time. You know, I'm, I'm learning that like, okay, it's taking time. Um, and I mean, there's so many great people. Like, it's not that they're like, ever, I've, ever, I've met so many amazing people, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like, you really have to work well together to go into an asset like yes for years. like it, it's a different dynamic than just building the network and kind of, you know those type of activities so um so you're solo right now and you're just working to strengthen your investor base and create education for your investors which is super super cool um so what exactly like are you looking for to buy like multifamily? Like what's your buy box or the things that you're looking for? Yeah, for me, my markets are in Indiana and Ohio. I am looking for anything less than 100 units um, that are value add, um, class B assets in like C plus, B minus, B areas. I don't really want B plus, A minus because um, like the growth, the those are great neighborhoods, but the growth potential is not as high with those. So those are my areas. And then... Um, like, it's funny because I talked with someone recently who's like, you know, right off the bat, people like it's hard for when you first come into real estate, like, where should I invest in? Mm -hmm. A lot of it, honestly, is just like sometimes just throwing like a little dark <laughs> down on the map trying to figure it out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> for me, like the easiest way is trying to figure out like no one wants blue states these days to invest in, which is understandable. Like that's totally. the reason why. Yeah, that's the reason why yeah. I don't invest in Seattle. So right off the bat, you already throughout a bunch of markets and states, right? And then you look at red states, like where it is in red states that you want. And then you have to look at growth. 
Mm-hmm. So you, some of the things that you could look at is like, you know, Census Bureau. You can look at another one would be like, you know, Starbucks, Whole Foods, or like um, another great one, the U-Haul migration pattern. Because mm-hmm. U-Haul puts out a report all the time where they're like, here are the top cities where people are renting and driving a one-way van to, but not leaving oh. out. So that's a good one as well, right? Never so that you that. look, that's yeah. Great. So you look at all those and you cross-reference to see like where do you see like what are some of the, a lot of them are repeats too right with growth or with like you know store openings with the u-haul migration pattern like these are all so you'll see a lot of repeats and then from there once you see the repeats that's when it's honestly like you know what nebraska doesn't really excite me as much as <laughs> like you know somewhere else <laughs> so you can just base it off that right <laughs> yeah yeah i know because I, I, I border ne- uh, nebraska and kansas and i'm always like oh but the numbers could be really good and then i'm like yeah but what happens if so, you know I, a, another COVID or you start to think about these things differently so yeah very cool so you're you're um you're looking for so and Wait, say your buy box one more time. So uh, less than 100 units, uh, value add in class B assets in C plus and B minus and B areas, neighborhoods. Nice. Okay, cool. Awesome. So and then actually go ahead and tell us how people can get a hold of you too. Oh, yeah. Um, you can always follow me on Instagram. My name is um, ZZ underscore song S O N G 23 on Instagram. I am very good at responding to those DMs and that's basically it. Um, Yeah, that's basically it. I'm currently working on getting my um, website up. Uh, My company, the fund name is going to be called Vitality Funds. And because it's, you know, it kind of appeals to the healthcare professionals. I'm working on getting, yeah, thank you. I'm getting, working on getting the website up for that. So it looks, everything looks professional and everything currently working on logo design. So that's taking up a little bit of time. I hired a company to do it for me because I'm not a creative person. (laughs) So I'm like, I have no idea what to do, you know, (laughs) but I also kind of like, actually, I want to spin it back on you a little bit because you said you've been doing a lot of, you know, broker or direct to seller outreach. Like, do you have, like, are you finding partners or how are you planning on attacking that asset or purchasing that asset? You know, once let's say a seller or a broker is like, Hey, I have this deal for you and underwriting goes really well. Like, how are you planning on closing on those assets? Yeah. So I have basically just been obviously building my network and my relationships with people. Um, and I really do like the mom and pop space. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because I love like the elderly people and having those conversations. But so I love that elderly space or not elderly, sorry, mom and pop space where um, I feel like the, you know, five to 15 units, I could handle my husband and I could handle ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in my markets, I'm I'm still finding people that would be boots on the ground. Um, yes. Obviously talking to brokers there, building relationships. I'm also finding people that are interested, that want to be more like LP, like don't want to have anything to do with operations, but they would be interested in those markets. So I kind of have created like a list or in the back of my mind, like here's the five people for this. Here's the five people for this in my specific markets. Um And it's been more of like a selfish journey, I guess I would say, because everything has just been like my market, like focused on my market, find people who'd be interested in my markets. And then I'm personally like doing the calling and the outreach in my market. What I've come across is some things, which is really neat. I've come across things that um, in my lists and everything that are stuff that I get on the phone with and the stuff I'm not really interested in. So what I've also done, like kind of my strategy is to have I'm really big on like my name and my reputation and yeah. people to connect people with. And so I have like five like great buyers that I'm like, I know that they would buy in this market. They're mm-hmm. super experienced in, in multifamily. And so if it's not something I could take on, I could obviously bring and maybe, you know, obviously become um, some, have some sort of equity in it um, to these like five people that I know would buy in the market. I know they're experienced. So it's, that's kind of been my journey, how I've been looking at it. It's like, go after what I, I personally would want to buy and then have a handful of people that I know would be interested in those same things. 
And then if I can't take it on myself, then bring in like one partner, two partners, or pass it on a bigger asset, pass it on to somebody that could totally take on that whole thing and be very well experienced. So for people, having buyers perform is extremely important to me. Like, yes, you know, especially in creative finance space, I like I have a one I'm kind of working through negotiations with a broker on right now. It's a smaller deal, but it's still a sub two. And I'm like, it to me, I'm like the any like the buyer has to be able to perform. Like, yeah, I, it makes me so nervous to you know pass something on or build a relationship with a seller or a broker. And not saying that we've ever had this, but it does make me nervous to pass it on. And all of a sudden, you know, six months later, the buyer's not performing, or and and it's a you know a subject too or a seller finance. And yes, I'm like, yeah. Ooh, so. Yeah. I've been working really hard to find the people that I feel like I can really trust. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's myself, whether it's one partner or whether I have to pass it on to people I think that would be really excellent um, operators, then that's been my strategy. Is it great? Who knows? I mean, I don't have anything under contract yet, you know, but I feel like I'm making progress. <laughs> no, that's all that matters. Like it's, yeah. it's hard because I feel like pe- there's always this pressure of like, how many doors do you have? How many deals yeah. have you done? But it's like, how many out of the, like all the deals that people have done, how many of those ended up being crappy deals versus good deals, right? Like yeah. if like, as it's hard not to compare with your, uh, yourself against other people, just given the culture that we live in. But I think at the end of the day, for me, what I've been really working on is like, as long as I'm doing better compare what, to what I was doing last week, that's all that matters. Like to yeah. me, it sounds like you're doing a lot of progress. You're making great progress. And I think honestly, that's great. Like that's what you should focus on is just improving yourself and try to block out the external noise. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like you talk to people, they're like, I have 2000 doors. I'm like, dang. <sighs> <laughs> I'm behind by about 2000, you know, no, not really. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, you just, start yeah. to, you do, you really start you yeah. do into that trap. But yeah, um, what I love about, you know, kind of multifamily too, is I feel like definitely like the level of professionalism and the, like the level of um, the people that are more drawn to multifamily. I do love that th- there are a lot of people that will hold you to a higher standard, right? Yeah. I love that. So um, anywho, so yeah, well, thank you, ZZ. Thank I you for your time. So thank you so much for joining me. This is great. You dropped some really good nuggets. Like I never have heard of this U-Haul thing before. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. And I that just, I don't know, that might make me sound super inexperienced, but truly, no, I'm like, that's it's great. so cool. It's just like different ways of looking at how you determine your markets, right? Like yeah. for me, I'm investing out of state. Like next month, I'm actually go- flying out to Ohio to do some market research. Like I'm going to be meeting with property management I'm going to be um, like meeting with some brokers to establish nice. that relationship because a phone call is a phone call, but it's like when you meet in person, you show up and you like, oh, you actually flew out here from Seattle to actually like talk to me. That's that says something versus yeah. just a phone call too, right? So these are all the things that you have to think about when it comes to like investing out of state versus like where your home markets are or just like trying to make yourself stand out whether you're doing direct doing outreach or if you're doing capital raising or as an operations um, operator, like figuring out like how you can just get better relationship building. That's all it is at the end of the day. Yeah. 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 It is. And I think you're great at relationship building. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, love, I do love people. I honestly yeah. do. I'm like, there's, gosh, we were put on like this planet with like a billion amazing people. Like it's really cool. So it is really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say like, if you ever feel stuck, honestly, like I've utilized chat GPT for a lot of things. (laughs) (laughs) Like a lot of the paid version, not the free version. The paid version is actually great. Cause I'm like, can, instead of Googling it, I just type it in. I'm like, can you give me the top 10 medical conferences in my area? And it just does it. And it just lists it out. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's good. So do that. You know, like yeah. these are the things that you can think about where it cuts down on your time yeah. in terms of research. Cause you have kids, I have kids, our time, we have like jobs and other things to do. Our time is limited. We have to be very intentional with our time and our goals. Right. So just think about like different things that you can do to like help shave that off. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good tip too. Cause I, yeah, yeah. I, I only look at chat, chat GP right now, like 
um, content, like for people who want to just spit out a bunch of content for me, you know, type of, yeah. I never really like thought of to use it like that. That's really yeah. cool. Use it for any kind of knowledge, any kind of like, if you're feeling kind of stuck, like for me, I legit asked it, like I asked for, for it to create a person, an investor persona for me. I was like, give oh. me a persona of someone of someone who's working in healthcare that's would be interested in investing in real estate. And it gave me like, obviously all fake, like a fake name, fake age, fake background, fake experience. Like what would be, they be interested in? Why are they thinking about investing in real estate? And then I would be like, okay, some things you could ask me like, um, what are the top 20 questions this persona would have about investing in real estate? And then you could be like, provide me some answers for that. Or you, I like for me, I'm currently working on branding. So I yeah. legit this morning was like, what are some logos? What are some symbols or icons that would appeal to this persona? And it gave me a list. So these are all the things that you can think about. Like that just brings you outside of the box, honestly. And like, you can always refine it to be like, I don't like this piece. I like this piece. Could you expand more on that? And then it starts to get to know you better. And it just brings it to the next level. It's honestly amazing. Oh my gosh, I know. it's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. So get into it really. Like it's, it's truly, it's been life changing. Wow. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much, ZZ. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a so pleasure. Good. Honestly, it's so good. I probably talked way too much. No. But thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Hopefully people will get some kind of value out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.